Okay. I assume everybody can hear me. Um, so welcome to um, November's NHIP Advanced Therapy Satellite Seminar. Just, just as an, a very, very brief introduction. So Newcastle Health Innovation Partners is our academic health science center, which is a, um, a prestigious organization which brings together Newcastle Hospital, Newcastle University, um, Cumbia, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, NHS Trust, Newcastle City Council, and what's now called, I'm going to forget this now, it used to be called the A8 Academic Health Science Network, and now it's um, Health, Health Innovation Northeast and North Cumbria. So, uh, and one of the uh, areas of, of research that we are keen to develop further as NHIP is advanced therapies. So we have something called an advanced therapy satellite, which is developing a strategy for advanced therapies amongst the partner. And, and we meet as kind of a committee every other month. And in between times, we, we invite a, a, a speaker, a, a seminar speaker. Usually you would see Shoba doing this next bit, which is introducing the speaker, but sadly Shoba's had to pull out this morning um, as she's not well. So um, I'm, it's great, actually, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Anne Black, who actually I've, I've known more or less since I started in Newcastle 21 years ago, because Anne was very integral to our very first tolerogenic dendritic cell study. And of course, we're about to start our second one. So that's how long these things take to progress. So. Um, Anne's title is um, Optimizing Practical Advanced Therapy Implementation in the NHS, which is a very important theme right now in, in terms of how these therapies get to patients. But for those that don't know her, Anne's a member of the NHS Specialist Pharmacy Service based at the RVI, um, and she's the Regional Quality Assurance Specialist Pharmacist for the Northeastern Yorkshire. Um, she developed an interest and expertise in clinical trials and in particular advanced therapies as she um, as she became involved with Newcastle Advanced Therapies as the qualified person for investigational medicine and products. And that's how I met her some years ago. She subsequently uses expertise to emphasize the important role of pharmacy to optimize patient safety in the delivery of these medicines. She's chair of the NHS Pan UK Pharmacy Working Group for ATIMPS, as they're called was a steering group member of the Northern Alliance Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre, as well as sitting on the NHS Pharmaceutical QA Committee and the National Pharmacy Clinical Trials Advisory Group. So we're very lucky to have you here in Newcastle, Anne. You, you're clearly doing a, a load of good stuff um, <laughs> nationally. Um, but anyway, we're looking forward to your, your presentation. Um, are you sharing, can you share your screen? Have you got the- I am certainly gonna have a go, yes. Great, um... thank you. Lovely, really? that's perfect. Yep, we can see that. We can see that. Have you got that on? Um... Yep, it's present. It's present. It's, um, yeah, it's the right way around. <laughs> it's the right way around. That's perfect then. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, introduction, John. And it's re I'm really delighted to to be um, invited to, to speak on this um, great series of discussions mm. that you're having, great series of webinars. So, yeah, um, I mean, you've covered everything in the introduction there. And, uh, yeah, I'm basically a pharmacist who is trying to work with a whole group of pharmacists nationally to um, you know, provide some underpinning guidance and medicines management to make sure that we can um, implement these brilliant innovations um, for patients as seamlessly as possible. So over the next sort of 40 minutes, what I'm uh, hoping to, to cover for you is um, Basically, I mean, I don't. We're not going to really dwell on an ATMP refresher because I'm sure this audience is 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 well up to speed with what ATMPs are, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, a systems approach to implementation of ATMPs, and I'm going to sort of try and touch on some examples and top tips for you from from real life experiences that we've had. So. To get started, just so that everyone is on the same page, an advanced therapy medicinal product um, is a biological medicine. So hence pharmacy is interested because they're medicines 
And really, as John was just saying, we wind back to 2007 when the um, e the regulation came in around ATMPs. We had to start putting in place in Newcastle um, a licensed manufacturing unit, um, and that's really where where we met and where where I got got involved because being involved in pharmacy QA, we were able to harmonise some of our systems uh, across. And in that, I was very lucky because I've got a lot more experience around um, cellular medicines and understanding around ATMPs generally. So there's three categories of ATMPs, um, somatic cell therapy medicinal products, tissue engineered products, and uh, gene therapy medicinal products. The fourth, if you like, is a combination ATMP, which is any of the both plus a, a, a medical device. So if we think about the journey um, of ATMPs, really, um, we, we start off at the research side where many of you um, expert scientists will be bringing through the innovation. We then have to go through a process to make it um, able to be manufactured so that it's fit for clinical use. So that process is what we call it process engineering, where we're bringing things in line with good manufacturing practice. We then manufacture um, and, and have to understand the characterization, put in place QC tests for the, for the products um, if they're cellular. Then hopefully we'll move towards clinical trials, potentially then towards a marketing application, and then through commissioning, NHS implementation. Um, and so it's quite a long pathway before we get to routine clinical practice with ATMPs. And I suppose my message is that wherever you are on that pathway, hopefully you can see yourself thinking, all right, yes, I sit in that research box or I sit in that manufacturing and QC box. I'm a clinical trials pharmacist, whatever you are on that pathway. We all need to be really beginning with the end in mind. It's a classic sort of design um, statement. But in, in reality, if we think about what we want at the end of this, getting it into routine clinical practice all the way through that process, we'll make better decisions and make more implementable products. And just to break down that developer's journey a little bit further, if we start with research, go through process engineering, manufacturing, clinical trials, we end with a marketing authorization. And I just wanted to sort of challenge you to think, what is keeping patients safe throughout that process? Well, you could argue it's the regulatory controls. The, we have good manufacturing practice through man, the manufacturing um, and the process engineering bits, and we have good clinical practice when we're running uh, clinical trials. So arguably, if we're in the trial stage, the risks are controlled as long as we've got all the key stakeholders involved. <clears throat> and if we, again, just think about that production life cycle, think about right back to the preclinical phase through process engineering to clinical manufacture, what, what, you, what you need to do, my best advice, is to engage early with your GMP team to optimize the applicability of your preclinical work. You might be able to get some preclinical work that is done that could be brought through and minimize what needs to be done in this process engineering stage. Um, and so and, and basically also reverse engineer in that product design space. Think about how you're going to get an implementable product. So the science is brilliant, but also think about what the product's going to look like, what the packaging's going to look like, what the stability is going to look like, what the QC is going to look like, because all of that is going to make a massive difference to how um, well the product is implemented in the future. And then if we actually think about the implementation journey, so after you've got that pot of gold, you've got the marketing authorization. They've then got to go through a commissioning process, um, get it through um, through NICE, through um, NHS England, how you become a commissioned centre. You then get, have to get some um, setup work done in your organisation before you can get the, the clinical practice into patients and, um, you know, have, have that patient benefit. So essentially... Um, you can see that road doesn't look quite as smooth. There's a few more bumps and potholes in this road. And so, again, if we challenge ourselves with the same question, what is keeping patients safe? Perhaps it's a little bit less clear as we move towards regular implementation of ATMPs. We've got a summary of medicinal product characteristics, which we need to follow. Um, but what we actually have is limited experience in delivering this. We're not using our research um, expert teams. Uh, we're using you know, business as usual um, staff. So arguably, 
these are high risk medicines and therefore we need some, some governance in place. So if you're an NHS centre that wants to introduce an ATMP, you need to be thinking about this from a clinical perspective, from an operational perspective, and of course, from a governance perspective. And you need to make sure that your systems cover licensed medicines, clinical trials and unlicensed medicines, because um, all of these are used in, in the NHS currently. So I thought we'd just have a little look at what is available. So at the moment, what we have um, what we have commissioned and available in NHS centres in England are those um, 12 ATMPs. And what's interesting um, is that you can see that most of them, if you look at the, the column here on the, <clears throat> on the right, most of them are gene therapies. So um, we split between ex vivo and in vivo gene therapies. Um, and ex vivo gene therapy is usually a cellular product where the starting material is procured from the patient and the genetic modification happens in a GMP laboratory. And in vivo gene therapy is where the, the, um, the viral vector is injected into the patient and the GMO, the, the genetic modification happens inside the patient's body. So most of the commissioned ones that we have at the moment, there's a couple of tissue engineered products, but mostly they are gene therapies. So obviously we're going to talk a little bit more about gene therapies today than anything else. And the names, goodness knows where they're all coming from because um, yeah, so somebody commented it was more like a, a help, help for Scrabble than it is anything else because there's some very unusual names there. What isn't on this list, and everybody may have heard um, about the exciting news last week, the Vertex product, ExoCell, I'm going to shorten it to, was granted a marketing authorization last week. That was a world first for CRISPR technology. Really, really exciting stuff. That has not um, gone through the commissioning process yet. It's been evaluated by NICE currently, so that isn't on this list yet, but it, you know, hopefully that one will be there soon. And if we look at the what's happening with clinical trials, um, this is data from the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult database. Um, we can see that the clinical trials, the dark blue there, they're still increasing year on year. Perhaps you could say that the, the growth has slowed. Um, in 2022 there, I think there was 178 trials ongoing for ATMPs um, with an 168 in 2021. Um, so we, we are having uh, a growth, but you could say the growth is slowed. That could be an artifact of COVID, um, which hasn't um, shown itself yet, or it could be that, that it is slowing. We'll, we'll, it'll be interesting to see. And again, the breakdown by type, as we've said, mostly three quarters ish are gene therapies, about half and half in vivo and ex vivo, um, small slice of tissue engineered products and some somatic cell therapy products there in clinical trials at the moment. And then just for completeness, unlicensed use of ATMPs um, is increasing uh, or it's becoming much more visible to pharmacy. I don't know which one it is really, but um, an unlicensed medicine is used to treat a patient or a group of patients with a special clinical need under the supervision of a individual clinician. So often this might be exiting a trial via a compassionate program. It might be um, an ATMP that's licensed in another country, but not come to the UK market for, for, for one reason or another. It could be that it's been rejected by NICE, therefore not commissioned. Um, and the, the key thing with unlicensed medicine use is that the liability transfers to the organization. So the quality of the product becomes the responsibility of the purchasing pharmacist and the clinical applicability is the, the responsibility of the prescribing clinician. So um, organizations need to make sure that their ATMP policy covers unlicensed medicines so that when um, when a request is coming through, um, you know, it, it doesn't create a big governance issue. So I chair the Pan UK Pharmacy Working Group for ATMPs and you know how do we help what are we all about so we're a specialist pharmacy service group um, the specialist pharmacy service is um, commissioned by NHS England we're a group of specialists in QA procurement medicines use and safety and um, we, we were supported um, by the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centre funding that came through and was, was, was very beneficial um, in the Northern Alliance at ATTC. Unfortunately, that has stopped, but we did get a good bit of momentum through, through being supported in that way. Um, and so we're sort of up and running and, and still, still going. And what we have now is a national group of about 40 or 50 um, pharmacy professionals largely 
um, who um, many of are now some some hospitals are are employing consultant pharmacists some and, and and specialists to deal with ATMPs and certainly those ones who do that do seem to be being very successful in terms of um, being able to become commission centres or trial centres. So um, what we are trying to do is continuously improve and aid safe and optimal implementation of ATMPs, whatever they are. And we've got three subgroups. There's sort of clinical operational education, we've got clinical trials, and we've got a regulatory and governance group. And we've produced a lot of a lot of pragmatic guidance, which is available on the SPS website. And I'm going to walk you um, through some of it um, just now. Um, just so that you can, you know, be aware of what is out there. So there's a couple of fundamental documents that we have. And the first is the role of pharmacy in um, the successful delivery of ATMPs. And this was one of the first documents that was written. And basically it says ATMPs are medicines, therefore the chief pharmacist is responsible. An organization delivering ATMPs needs to have a very clear governance process in place, which is if you're doing trials, it needs to be an additional um, process to your R&D, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a moment. And the other really fundamental document around gene therapies is governance and preparation requirements. And really that document is there because I, I was just getting so many inquiries about how to get started with the gene therapy trial, or how, where can we pre prepare them, where can we make them? And so we put in place some guidance and, and actually it's been um, endorsed by the RPS, it's also now used as a standard in the NHSE commissioning process. And what it does is details the health and safety executive requirements for a genetic modification safety committee and tells people practically how to, to, to get that set up. So it's, and in its second half, it supports the decisions around where to make um, gene, uh, gene therapies. Um, you know, can they be made in clinical areas? Can they be made in existing pharmacy? Uh, facilities, what sort of supervision do you need if, um, if, if they're cellular, etc. who should be doing that. And the other fundamental documents, which I, I believe are very, very helpful if you're wanting to get started in gene therapies and really whatever your background is, whether you're a scientist, a researcher, a manufacturer, I think it's very beneficial to understand the implementation and therefore have, have a look at these documents. And, and what they are is that basically Pharmacy institutional readiness for tissue engineered products, for somatic cell therapies, for virus based in vivo gene therapies and for ex vivo gene therapies, the, the cell based ones. And um, what we do in each of those documents is basically go through a process flow um, with all of the things that you might need to think about, whatever the, the medicine is that you're dealing with. So whatever the gene therapy is. Um, think about all these things. They won't all be relevant, but some of the principles that are talked about will. And the other thing that it has is that for each stage, we have a checklist. So we can't mandate how hospitals implement um, gene therapies. But what this does is supports hospitals by giving them all the things to think about when they're putting their systems in place. Um, so really can't recommend those highly enough. And we did do individual ones for CAR-T therapy because CAR-T therapy obviously was a very big uh, thing when we, we got the license ones through there in 2018. And so um, the concept of institutional readiness, we um, put forward through CAR-T therapy and then realized we absolutely can't do that. We don't have the resources to do it for every single ATMP that comes through. So we've produced those category ones that I just showed you for the four categories. So, um, from the point of view of um, clinical trials, these are very familiar stages to you, I'm sure. Feasibility, site selection, site initiation, recruiting, follow up and close down. Um, but what we need to do though for ATMPs in particular is to have in place a level of organizational governance that sort of sits above that. Um, and it needs to be additional to R&D processes. So why is the question that you often get? Are we just adding in extra bureaucracy? No, I mean, so the, the, the facts are that these are innovative medicines, often with innovative um, administration techniques. There will be some potential regulatory um, changes that, that people who are running trials are not usually aware of. So perhaps you might need a human tissue authority license for human application if you were doing autologous cell therapy um, trials. 
Um, it might well be that you need HSE um, for gene therapies. It might be um, if you're looking at deliberate release, you need to engage with DEFRA. And these things are not embedded in normal R&D processes. So you need to have your governance processes in place to make sure that that is the, the case. Also, the reliability considerations, some cell therapy products, um, if, if they're um, if there's going to be a hazard to the patient by not receiving them, where they're autologous, perhaps, um, if the product is actually out of specification, there is a regulatory route for being able to administer it, but the liability then moves back to the organisation and, and the treating physician within that organisation. So those things need governance. And then fundamentally, there is media interest in these products. Um, and I know certainly in Newcastle, there's there's been press here um, when we've had patients in trials um, and um, you know, TV cameras, etc. So um, when the, the organization needs to be aware that this is happening. So how do we put in place that organizational? Well, we need an, uh, an ATMP policy, um, which details the, the, the committees that are required um, and how um, an organization will approve a particular ATMP and, and think about its medicines management. So um, what then do we think about a feasibility? You know, if you can you do a particular trial? Um, it might well be that a, a sponsor comes and talks to you, um, and and can you do that trial? Well, um, no, you, you need to have a think about what is feasible. So, have you got the right storage data? Um, ambient, fridge, freezer, mostly easy in a pharmacy. Ultra low getting easier since COVID. We've got a lot more minus 80 freezers than we used to have. And cryo storage will almost certainly mean you have to work with your stem cell lab colleagues and um, or perhaps outsource to a third party such as a, a blood and transfusion service. And then you need to think about things like, you know, is there a preparation step, a reconstitution step required? Um, and um, if there is, um, what is the in-use stability post-preparation? So is that going to mean if you're working with an NHSBT that the time is too long, you can't get it, so that means it's not feasible for you to be a site? Or um, what's the optimal preparation location? What are the, Have you got suitable facilities? And if you have got suitable facilities, is there capacity to undertake the work? Um, and then also, um, if you need to have a, a labelling step after um, after a reconstitution activity with an Annex 13 compliant label, which is absolutely recommended for ATMPs, then you do need to have um, pharmacist or medical supervision for that step. So it's just getting all of these things ironed out and all of that is covered in that gene therapy document. And we've put in place guidance for where the protocol doesn't tell you where you have to make the product or where the um, SMPC doesn't tell you where you have to make the product what is the best place to make a product. So and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but it's all there in that gene therapy guidance. The document is under review, but the, the principles are still very sound. Um, and if you're a sponsor of a trial, um, the top advice is specify the required environment rather than the device. Um, certainly studies that are coming over from America often specify biological safety cabinet and that is just not for an in vivo gene therapy study, and it is not something that we would recommend is used. Um, we use um, isolators in the UK that provide a better um, assurance of, of the environment for the quality of the product, safety of the operator, et cetera. So specifying the environment rather than the device um, is, 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 is recommended. We've also got guidance for cellular products. <clears throat> Same advice goes for those as well. Capacity I touched on, and this is becoming a huge issue for in vivo gene therapy studies. Um, on the picture there, that is that that is actually um, all of the vials that are put aside to, to make one dose of one of the haemophilia in vivo gene therapies. So you can imagine, look at all the aseptic manipulations, the risk, the micro risk in that process is quite extreme. It's not something that can be done in the clinical area. It needs to be done in a, in a, a pharmacy aseptic unit, in an isolator. And if, even though it's a low risk product, it might not require its own dedicated facility. If you want to use existing um, aseptic facilities, there may be a way that that could happen. You'd have to work it out through your risk assessment process. But to make this product with all the associated cleaning and SOPs and setup and everything that you would need, 
So it's not going to take less than three hours of your cabinet time. And if you're that, if that's your cabinet that you're using for a busy, you know, chemotherapy service, for example, then that is a problem. Um, we need optimal presentation of IMP. Um, I mean, if, if in some ways, you know, we do have dedicated research staff, clinical trials teams, um, but that doesn't usually translate through to pharmacy aseptics. Um, and so this is where the blockers that we talked about before, it's well, well, well covered that apheresis can be a blocker for, ex for, for autologous products, but pharmacy aseptics is becoming more and more of an issue. Um, for those products that, that require that preparation. So we need the vial size, the number of manipulations, the disinfection time, the preparation time to be minimized um, so that we can get these uh, products through. And, and we need sponsors to, to, to take that on board. Unfortunately, what happens is I think there's, so, there's such a lot of excitement to get the product through because of the innovation and the patient impact that um, they're not thinking about the practicalities and we need, we need those messages to get through. Costing template use, um, there is obviously for, for, for um, spon um, commercial studies, the interactive costing template that is required to be to be used. And um, we've sort of put some guidance together around the standardized approach, which has been incorporated into NIHR costing guidance. Um, and also very useful for sponsors to understand how we will be costing these trials. Um, proactively so that there's no surprises because there's often pushback on costing. Um, so we're making sure that everything is covered, but you know, also trying to be very pragmatic to, to not um, be a blocker to, to research in our hospitals. Um, that's under review currently because it, um, there has been quite a lot of pushback. And I think as we're evolving and some hospitals are getting their systems in places, it is time for a review on it. So at the site initiation stage, um, You'd be looking at distribution arrangements. Um, once you've decided, you, you know, it is feasible, you're going to do it, you're going to, you have to go through that proactive checklist that we talked about, the institutional readiness, and then think about what else you need to think about. So um, since we've um, exited from the EU, um, if the product has been manufactured in the EU, there's an additional um, step that's required on import. Um, and we've, um, that caused a bit of confusion in practice. So we've put some guidance together there, operational implications of the UK exit from the EU guidance for pharmacy clinical trial sites. And um, of course, all of the other all of the other bits and pieces that that, that, that you need to think about. And, and the top tip in this circumstance is to undertake a dry run of the whole process. If you're talking about marketed products, it's very overt that the products um, are, are, are often in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions per dose in terms of pounds. Um, so we can't afford to be getting these things wrong. It's, we've got to get it right first time and, and you absolutely need to an, an undertake a, a dry run of the whole process. And then once the trial is recruiting, um, there are other things to think about with ATMPs that you wouldn't have with other with other products. So out of specifications, I touched on on that before. Um, if it's a cellular ATMP, there might be an occasion where it can be used on ethical grounds. You need a governance process in place um, for that to for that to happen. And we've got some specific guidance on on how out of specifications can be used um, in certain situations there and, and what we recommend the process looks like. So our top tips for sponsors of trials are that they understand the site's requirements. You know, they often think, oh, the, these sites are being a, a pain, you know, asking these questions, but actually all of the questions that are being asked have been asked for good reason. Um, and so we want the sponsor to understand um, the, the, what the site will need. And we want them to then preempt the questions and design a deliverable process. Um, and, and to do that, they, they need to understand the role of the sponsor pharmacy. So within SPS, we've put together some web pages there on the role of the sponsor pharmacy in clinical trials, um, so that when you're a sponsor, you know what your responsibilities are from that perspective. And then also we've put together a checklist for um, clinical trials for what we expect to see in a pharmacy manual. If you if you if, if a sponsor follows all the information that's in there, then they won't get the questions that, that from from the sites that that sort of delay things. So um, we're trying to be proactive, um, and uh, you know that's 
what we want to try and do. And then for product designers, researchers, we've given some a, a document here with a research um, focus to, to think about product design considerations early on in the process. Um, encouraging that reverse engineering. And, and this really document gives some real world examples. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit more on that just before I finish. Also, you know, the, um, the Pan UK Pharmacy Working Group has been involved in pharmacy learning and resources for, for all, um, all uh, disciplines um, at all levels, basically. So there's a lot of resources on the website, but also, as I've mentioned, we were part of the um, ATTC and there's a, a great clinical trials section on, an, on the NHS readiness toolkit, which the, the link is there for. So whatever stage you are, whether you're the developer, whether you're the sponsor, whether you're part of a site delivering a trial, there, there's, a, there's a whole wealth of resources out there for you. So um, many of you will know that um, Lord O'Shaughnessy was commissioned by the government to do a review of commercial clinical trials in the UK, and this was published earlier in the year. So it did mention ATMPs in a few places. Um, it said that we should be leveraging our strategic advantages in genomics, cell and gene therapies, and precision medicine to provide more trials for advanced therapies. It also pulled out the fact that research is not being systematically prioritized um, within the NHS, and um, you know that stakeholders it, who who had um, informed the review had cited a shortfall of of research nurses, pharmacy, imaging resources, and the aseptic teams that I've already touched on, um, and 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 made it very clear that we need to make sure that that infrastructure is in place for research. It also um, talked about a comprehensive, a re made a recommendation that there's an, a, a comprehensive and mandatory national approach to costing in partnership with industry. There's some of our guidance uh, with the NIHR will, will help with that. And it specifically brought out that that should be applied to advanced therapy medicinal products. And then the, the last thing that it did was talk a lot about BioNTech collaboration and cancer vaccines in particular, which are causing quite a lot of noise in the system at the moment. And some of you may be aware of that. So we've got all of this guidance, we've been working really hard for the last 10 years to make sure that, that, that everything's in place. And yet the O'Shaughnessy report is, is clearly telling us that UK research is not fixed. So, so what's the problem? Um, is it about dissemination? I think, yes, it, it probably is. But also, I think it's because we're in such an evolving field. Um, you know, we've got new scenarios being thrown at us all the time. I mean, I was on a call just recently about deliberate release gene therapies instead of contained use. Um, you know, there's a there's an ATMP that's going to be a um, a gel um, for, to, to help to help um, a really debilitating disease called um, EB. And um, it's really important that we find ways of practically implementing these. Um, but actually, is it just deliberate release if it needs to be used in patients' homes? And, oh, we haven't got any guidance on deliberate release yet, so we need to think about that. Um, and patients' homes, we haven't got, you know, healthcare professionals trained in primary care, uh, home care systems. You know, at the moment, we're just about getting to a point that we can deliver these things safely in hospitals. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And then we've got new new innovations, cancer vaccines, so-called. Um, they can be classed as gene therapies if they're biological in their in their origin. So um, mRNA, it might be chemically synthesized. It might be biologically um in, in its or origin and if it is then if it then it becomes a gene therapy um essentially the science is ahead of the regulations and so it, it, it causes difficulties so in the O'Shaughnessy report it said that um, BioNTech is going to provide NIHR with advice advanced sight of their pipeline of immunotherapy clinical trials so-called cancer vaccines it's actually a misnomer because the definition of a vaccine is um, for infectious disease um, but that's what they that's what they are being called. But they're essentially they are immunotherapy clinical trials. Um, and NIHR have been engaged to try and work proactively to um, with the research community to prepare these trials to try and make them facilitated and, and a little bit um, easier to implement. 
So our recommendation from the Pan UK Working Group is that actually NIHR and BioNTech use our guidance, do some inst institutional readiness pathways for these products to try and you know work out what the problems are in advance, but what the failure modes will be in advance, and make sure that those gaps are filled um, as we introduce these trials. And in that way, we'll be able to get that consistent implementation to get the data and the and the patient safety that we want with the right attention to all the things that we need to be thinking about. And I'm pleased to say an update, just as of yesterday, um, our clinical trial subgroup is now in, in discussions with, with BioNTech to, to try and help with those things. So that, that's really good news. So I think in pharmacy, with respect to ATMPs, um, we've got a standardized approach to implementation. We've got an organizational um, governance advice um, and um, and we we standardize operational and clinical implementation. And with that, what we're trying to do is minimize delays and maximize benefits. But a, qu a question, I guess, for the for the audience is, you know, how on earth can we raise awareness of these resources and their value system wide? Um, because we've still got the problems, um, and uh, we, we're, we're quite good at disseminating within pharmacy. But I don't think outside of pharmacy we do that great a job. We need to, you know, get get out there. And just to sort of finish off, um, I thought we'd um, talk a little bit about some learnings from actual experience that we've had. So, um, and this this comes from that optimizing product design document. So, um, which, which there's a lot more detail in, but I've just pulled out a little bit. But um, in vivo gene therapies. So I think I've touched on this already. The requirements to use a specified clean air device for preparation. Um, but hospital pharmacies don't routinely have them. Um, so um, I, I'm aware of a hospital down south that went on and, and bought a, a biological safety cabinet, you know, because they thought that's what they needed to do. But actually, it wasn't. They just needed to to go back and, and, and utilize the facilities that they had. Um, we do, you know, encourage increasing capacity in new facilities, but not by the use of biological safety cabinets. That's not a GMP. Uh, approach that's that, that is recommended in the in the new Annex One sterile manufacture of medicines guidance. <clears throat> so we recommend that they're prepared in isolators, which are routinely available. So for ex vivo gene therapies, and there there was some queries around the freezing profile for apheresis material, which was too specific and required change from business as usual for clinical sites. Now, this is an example whereby there wasn't a resolution possible after the marketing authorization had been gained. Um, so it's really important that sponsors and manufacturers and, um, you know, marketing authorization holders think about what business as usual in the NHS is, because requiring a different profile to what we're using routinely is just opening up the scope for error. And, um, we, you know, that, that needs to be thought about very carefully. Um, similarly, um, you know, we need increase, as much stability data as possible. So if a product presentation is not cryopreserved, um, there was one particular marketed product where the patient actually could only be treated by traveling internationally to a center over in Italy. Um, and it's not a patient focused solution. And actually, the uptake of the product hasn't been very good because of that. And, you know, if there'd just been a little bit more um, stability work done, perhaps there would have been something or, or perhaps, you know, a consideration of decentralized manufacture, um, you know, then perhaps that would have been able to engage more patient benefit. Somatic cell therapies, um, a post-thaw process step required manufacturing expertise and an MHRA license. So um, it was more than a reconstitution step um, that was required. Really what we want is for ATMPs to be um, ready to administer so that all they maybe need is a thaw um, if they're cellular. But um, where we do have to have reconstitution steps, then that's that that can that you know that can be managed, but where it's considered to be more than a reconstitution step and it's actually considered to be the last part of the manufacturing, then that is very, very difficult. Actually in Newcastle. Um, we're quite lucky because we're probably one of very few places in the country, maybe Newcastle and Great Ormond Street, where we could manage that because we do hold the right licenses. But um, in, it, it's not a strategy um, for uh, a, a successful product. 
So um, we want administration and delivery to consider the requirements of the clinical sites. Product design should ensure that only activities regulated as preparation or reconstitution are required on site. And then similarly, a, a short expiry date from one um, when delivered from a country in Europe. Um, anything that's got a shelf life really that's measured in hours rather than in, in days or weeks is going to be really disruptive to patient care, to, 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 to NHS systems and business as usual, if you like. So we again, that just comes down to, you know, not just thinking about the efficacy, but thinking about the, the product that you're making and, and getting in place all those characteristics and stability to, to make it a deliverable product. And then for tissue engineered products, again, it was an impractical commercialization with a very short post release uh, in use shelf life requiring unrealistic assurance avail of availability of NHS theatres. So, um, you know, the, 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 the manufacturing process was such that it could finish anywhere between, I'm going to say, for example, 11 and 14 days. And so the product might then have a 24 hour shelf life before it had to be transplanted into a patient. And so effectively, they wanted um, the company wanted to contract with hospitals to ensure that there was three days worth of theatre time kept free for, so that it could fit in with their requirements. Well, that isn't realistic, um, as you will all understand. Um, and so we had to renegotiate the contract to distribute the risk on that. And one of the other things that we're doing in the Pan UK Pharmacy Working Group is getting involved with helping NHSE to um, standardise contracts before they come to trust. So I think in summary, I've said it several times, undeliverable products can't fit into the NHS treatment pathway. So although they're innovative and so exciting for patients, we need to think about how, how, how they're going to work as well. And there's all sorts of, of challenges from a regulatory perspective, which we've put guidance in place for from an operational perspective. And then, of course, we have all the clinical um, uh, uh, issues as well. And certainly we put in place clinical guidance around toxicity, washout periods, concomitant medicines, et cetera, for, um, for CAR Ts, which are widely used across the country. So if we just um, to finish off, go back to that journey that we talked about at the start um, and look at um, what's happening in Newcastle. Well, you know, we're, we're really fortunate in Newcastle. We've got um, you know, brilliant universities where the research can happen, um, and um, we, uh, and we've got obviously you know top class hospitals in which um, we've got great clinicians who are also uh, you know passionate about delivering these innovative therapies for patients and healthcare practitioners right across the board. Um, but as I've mentioned, we're, we're also very fortunate we've got Newcastle Advanced Therapies um, who, you know, can contract manufacture. So, um, and, um, you know, that they've got manufacturing unit, MHRA licensed based Centre for Life there. And then also they're acting as an arm of pharmacy within the trust. And they are an arm of pharmacy within the trust. And um, and so we've got a, a great deal of, of of infrastructure in place that we can utilize to, to successfully bring these, these trials on board for patients and commercialized products as well. And then I'm gonna throw in, you've got access to me through the specialized pharmacy service. Um, and uh, and um, I think, you know, if we couple all of that, and think about what the NHIP Newcastle Health Innovation Partners is trying to achieve, um, working collaboratively to translate world-class research and innovation into real-world benefit, improving population health and generating economic growth for the North East and North Cumbria. I think we've got a really good, um, you know, basis here for actually doing something, you know, for wider than Newcastle. And I'm really trying to push that ICB level and regional level, we strategize a little bit more about how to ensure we've got equitable access to these innovative therapies for patients. Um, because I think that's something that 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 is needed, um, you know, absolutely. So as we as we look to the future, I'd love to think we're going to see ATMPs trans more more ATMPs transforming patients' lives, um, and embedded into businesses' usual healthcare. With you know, it, helping that that being facilitated by the guidance that we're producing from the Pan UK Pharmacy Working Group, and that we have research and delivery workforce prioritised strategically. Um, because that's really important and therefore we will end up with equitable access for all right across our geography. Um, it would be my utopia. So 
in conclusion, um, and I've put that little image there because I haven't really touched on money and there's always that balance of how do we afford these products, but that's probably not for today. But, um, you know, I think innovative medicines are exciting for patients and healthcare professionals. They're here to stay, but we need to make sure we get it right first time. So we need organizational governments. And actually, I think we need system leadership on a, on a wider basis. And, you know, maybe NHIP is, can help to influence that through, through their collaborations. So I hope that was the sort of thing you were after. Um, thanks very much. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you, Anne. That was fantastic. Uh, really, really interesting, actually. Um... And we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, just put your hand up if you've got a question. I'm going to start, and actually it's more clarification. There was something that you mentioned that I didn't quite understand, and you highlight something about, in is it intentional release? There was just a terminology that you used. Mm. I may have got that wrong, but there's something like intentional. It, it was deliberate release. So. That's one. Yeah, so for gene therapies, um, I must admit I'm I'm learning about this at the moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, if, if there's anybody who knows more about it than me on the on, on the call, please uh, please feel free to to come in and and uh, and answer. Um, but yes, when you have a gene a, a, a genetically modified organism, um, we're used to having. Um, so that being classed within a certain classification based on the containment requirements for how we stop it from getting out there essentially mm. so if you have a spillage you have to you know carry a waste kit with you you have to look at the shedding and the replication competence and you do that within your risk assessment which has to be done by the your genetic modification safety committee um but what um, I came across recently um was that actually once it moves to marketing authorization then effectively, you, you, you don't have to, you, then you're not having to note, if you're doing a trial, you have to notify the health and safety executive. You have to be in a, in a notified premises. And in certain situations, you, you know, you have to say where the, where the product's been administered, et cetera. Um, but I came across a situation just recently, um, and it was really around that um, innovative gel that I was talking about, where by um, might potentially going to be some unlicensed use of it somewhere in the country. And um, it was postulated that because it was happening in a patient's home, it, it was deliberate release as opposed to contained use, um, because there wouldn't be um, the uh, control over the containment. Okay. So deliberate re release is um, often around agricultural things, and it's actually controlled by DEFRA. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a meeting with DEFRA and with the hospital involved. And um, actually, it, it, once you get to deliberate release, um, it's actually very, very complex and takes a long time to get approval. They said it even has to go up to the Secretary of State, et cetera. You'd have to give you know patients names and addresses, et cetera. So actually, the health and safety executive and DEFRA were being as pragmatic as they could possibly be and mm. they were advising that the, the hospital, in this case, for the unlicensed use, still goes down the line of contained use wherever possible and makes the arguments for how well it can be contained within a patient's home, as opposed to saying it's deliberate release because that does get them into a world of regulatory and governance pain. But it's a new thing that's out there. There have been some vaccine trials that have been classified as deliberate release, and so our new updated guidance around gene therapy will have to just cover that. But what we'll probably do is really stress that we want people to keep going down the containment line wherever possible, um, because it is much more straightforward, although it might still feel as though it's quite hard work. Um, but if, um, and then we'll just give people the, 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 the information where to go if they do think it might be deliberate release what they're working on. Fantastic. Thank you. Any other questions from anybody? If you, if you look forward 10 years and or maybe 20 years, you know, there will be, as you, as you showed, there'll be a, a good number of advanced therapies, a lot of gene therapies, perhaps some somatic cell therapies. What will the last escape be? So do you think each region will have a specialist centre where people go or will they be deliverable closer to home or what, what's the vision for, for all of this? I mean, it, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment we're really still in quite rare disease land, mm. um, and we're still in, you know, 
where in the areas where the incident population and, and prevalent population can be managed from a fixed number of centres. So the way NHSE are commissioning currently varies depending on the on the ATMP that that um, is being looked at. Um, so for CAR Ts, for example, um, we had uh, eight sites initially in England that could provide and then they added on three more in a wave two and then they added on another 10 in anticipation of multiple myeloma indication which hasn't happened yet but um but essentially um i think it will very much depend on the population that is re required so i think it'll take quite a while for us to get to the point that everywhere needs to have all of this in place but the, the difficulty that we have is that actually for clinical trials what we end up with is not a commissioned land a commissioned and controls landscape it's very much if you have an interested clinician and this who knows the sponsor and wants to do the trial then that seems to lead to how you become a center so we can end up with centers who are doing trials who haven't got in place all of the governance that's required and so that's why it's really important that we put out this guidance by a chief pharmacist to make sure mm -hmm. that wherever you are there's a governance system so i think in 10 years time there'll be a lot more places um with the strategy um and um but what i actually think possibly we need as an interim measure or maybe even for 10 years time is we need to be thinking this on a regional basis we need to be mm -hmm. thinking on an icb level maybe um you know not everywhere has got the skills to be able to um you know handle these cellular products you know certainly from a pharmacy perspective um you know we don't recommend that pharmacy does anything more than than a thaw we need to work with our expert colleagues in uh, in, in in our stem cell labs etc and and have that oversight relationship um to make sure that 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 can happen now all the hospitals in the patch don't have a stem cell lab so wouldn't it be great if we were able to collaborate across the icb or across the region to make sure that there's equitable access for everybody and i think i mean i've actually emailed our icb leads and regional leads on this recently um because i i feel like in the northeastern yorkshire we could be some we could be an area that could could lead on this um but we'll we'll see what happens. But I think it needs a, a it needs a strategy, and at the moment it's a bit lacking. I think because it's still, I suppose, in its infancy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, interestingly, I was I was at the American Rheumatology meeting last week, and CAR T cells are starting to be looked at in autoimmune disease. You may have heard that there are twenty companies manufacturing CAR Ts for autoimmune indications. So, and they're not rare diseases. Uh, I, I don't think they're going to be. They'll be too expensive, but they seem to be having dramatic effects. Well, it's it, it, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's uh, yeah. I mean, the, I think the the science and the, the technology is uh, it's really exciting. What what could be done? And mm. yeah, I know. And and the, the, whether they're too expensive is you know, it's what's the um, health economic benefit? I suppose in terms of I mean, you know the treatments that aren't needed, etc. Um, and and all of that has to be worked out, which I guess is what Nice do. But um, it's yep. it is an exciting area for sure, and it, it's a great area to be involved with. I've certainly enjoyed what I've well, been doing. It. Okay. I'm old enough to remember when biologics were thought to be too expensive. Absolutely, so, been there before. <laughs> Me too. <laughs>